we are going to record this for all posterity for all times. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, when uh, Dr. Paul Henney and I started talking about this subject and I started putting it out there on social media, I realized we hit on something very, very hot. And this is going to be the first in a series of discussions on what I've just off the top called the, hyg the hygiene hygienist conundrum and the shortage or the apparent shortage of positions, good positions in hygiene, and also what we see as excessive, maybe monetary, maybe other demands, so to speak, in the world of dentistry and the communities that we're trying to create. So my good friend of, oh, 15, 20 years, Paul Henney is here with us. Paul has a very outstanding practice in Roanoke, Virginia. I've been privileged to visit him at his office and at his home. He is an amazing student and a, a, just a sponge of a learner and one of dentistry's most, um, how are we gonna say this? The, as opposed to the quality of your teaching and the universality of your recognition, uh, the quality of Paul's teaching is amazing. He is building now the Henny Center in Roanoke, uh, which is going to be not only magnificent in its appearance and its view, but also in what he's going to be teaching us. And we are going to talk today about a totally different approach to how we work with our communities. So fasten your seatbelts, suspend your disbelief, open your minds, and listen to what Paul and I are going to banter about. One warning, by the way, one warning, both Paul and I have this tendency to talk. And we are not, neither one of us is concise. So if you hear us overlapping, just laugh at us. That's all, because it's going to be a little funny. Anyway, Paul, thank you for joining me. It's always good to spend time with you. Thank you, Alan. That's high praise. I'm not sure I deserve all of that, but I try, you know, I grind it out every day and try to make uh, what I'm doing relevant, uh, both on a personal level and sharing the little bits of information. Most of it has not come uh, easily for me. They, uh, they've Most of what I know and understand since I've been doing this for such a long time, most of what I know and understand has, has come through really making me making a lot of mistakes, really. So uh, isn't that what we call learning, Paul? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> what, you know, what what goes around comes around. And, you know, this topic today of uh, particularly of hiring hygienists is not new. There's nothing new about that whatsoever. Um, so we can kind of get into that. Um, it, you know, the the variables that are driving the apparent shortage may be different, you know different economic circumstances, different cultural circumstances, mm -hmm. and so forth. But um, this has been a common phenomenon since hygienists came on the scene in the 60s. So um, yeah, this is an interesting topic. Yeah, I'll, I'm looking forward to it. All right, let, let's backdrop it. Um, and uh, our buddy, Dr. Bob Pick in Chicago is here. The purple cow is with us, or the indigo heifer, as I call him. Um, he, he is a, a fabulous periodontist um, who knows customer service better than most of us will ever know. But anyway, back to you, Paul. You started the Bob Barkley Study Club. And throughout my career, I've always heard his name way back here in the back of my mind. Um, and Barkley, Barkley was killed in a uh, tragic plane accident, um, I think, the day that I got married believe it or not. And, but his legacy lives on because of you. You've dug up so much of Barclay's knowledge and what you have now is gonna be very significant. So Paul, give us a little synopsis of who Dr. Barclay was and why this is so important for all of us. Well, just for starters, uh, Bob Barclay's legacy is, is not, uh, solely being advanced by me. I, I really stand on a number of other people's shoulders who did this before me, people like uh, Lynn Carlisle, people like Bob Frazier mm -hmm. um, and uh, Chuck Sorens and many, 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 Avram King, many people um, who befriended Bob when he was alive and was, were tremendously influenced by him either directly or indirectly in his writings and uh, in person in many cases. 
Um, and uh, I often wonder what dentistry would look like had Bob had Bob uh, survived. He died in 19, uh, 1977 in a tragic plane accident. So he had all kinds of plans for the future. He was just getting involved in, uh, he was already involved in, I think, three or four dental schools and helping dental schools not only um, select dental students, but as, as well as organize their curriculum, uh, reorganize their curriculum to be more person-centered and to have the patient's experience be um, team-oriented from year one to year four so that um, their care would be transitioned even after the departure of the student. There would be a care team that would look after that patient uh, even after the graduation of maybe the primary caregiver. So he looked at dental school as a potential holistic experience. And he um, also was really one of the first people that got into um, the consulting business from a um, organizational psychology point of view. Um, he did a lot of interesting work with Charles Chuck Sorensen, and they were using personality profiling and so forth, excuse me, <clears throat> to hire and they were, you know, doing a lot of uh, values clarification work, and uh, you know, developing of philosophy and mission statements, and just getting teams of people centered around these things, and then that would in turn drive who you hired, or yes. who you may or may not retain, which is a, a bit of our topic today. Yeah. So this is not a new idea. In fact, when I look back at uh, a lot of the stuff that Bob was doing in the 70s, early 70s, mid 70s, um, a lot of it still is kind of laying fallow. A lot of it is um, forgotten or, uh, you know, passed over. And it's so, it, it's timeless. It's still extremely relevant. And it applies to, it's, it applies well beyond dentistry. And uh, so, you know, part of my purpose is saying, you know, draw, continue to shine the spotlight on this information and, and the continued relevance of it. So, um, and that's a very exciting thing because the more, the more I learn, uh, the more fascinated I get about how sophisticated they were at that point in time. Yeah. And, and I, I think uh, I've, I've got a buddy and uh, I'm probably going to bring him back here if he allows me to, John Blumberg. Uh, wrote a book called Return on Integrity. And um, John also has a great course. And John is not a dentist. He is a uh, former consultant for, um, oh, I forget the accounting firm um, that handled Enron. Uh, John left before that debacle, Arthur Anderson. Um, but John has a, call, talks about principles of integrity and moral drift. And what winds up happening, I think, with, with that, it's happened in a lot of dental practices with a lot of us. It happens in human nature that we just have this moral center. We know where it is, right? And then we just drift ever so slightly, and that becomes the norm. And we go a little and a little and a little off. And all of a sudden, Bob Barkley's hair is on fire. And I, I, think, I think that's what you're referring to here. We have drifted off something very special. Well, I think, you know, on a, on a cultural level, we're in a completely different place now than where Bob Barkley was in the 70s. So, you know... In his time, it was a, you know, he was living in a strongly Judeo-Christian influenced culture. So there was a tremendous amount of, you know, the major, vast majority of people would go to church or synagogue or mosque uh, weekly. And so, and those messages would be moral, moral messages. So those would be the, what was coming out of the faith community was kind of helping erect the guardrails. Yeah. For how people thought and behave not everybody yeah. but the vast majority of people and that's enough to you know push the society forward in a broad way today everything is much more atomized a lot fewer people a lot less people are getting that kind of experience on a regular basis to help define those guardrails so what's happening is they're kind of starting to define them on their own or they're or they're they're starting to adopt them from other places like insurance companies or wherever they're they're accepting um, other people's boundaries or definitions and so forth and that's and that without a lot of um, stopping and introspection you do you you do get off the trail a lot yeah. and w we as dentists get so busy 
that usually, you know, it's not until Friday morning, maybe, or Friday afternoon that we finally stop and look back and say, what the hell just happened this week? <laughs> Why did I do that? Or what the heck just happened to me? And so we're, we're kind of in a reactive mode. We may be thinking about it even on the weekend, but we're not at a point where we can make any change. And then we just jump back in the same merry-go-round on Monday morning. Right. So, so here we are, if I may, Paul, two, two of us high-end expresses. So we're drifting a little. We have factors and forces intervening that we never thought would. And now along comes Avram King. Let's, let's wind back and go parallel and let's talk for a moment. What his book, Choosing to Choose, it's kind of hard to get, but if you could get your hands on it, eat it up. Um, that was one of your recommendations to me, Paul. But let's talk about Avram King and what he predicted decades ago, and let's bring that together, and that will begin to make sense of what the hell is going on here. Right. Well, you know, the reality is that Bob Barkley had primary influencers just like you and I do and have. You know, primary influencer of Bob Barkley was L.D. Pankey. He studied, he studied under L.D. Pankey, got a lot of his, a lot of his basic thinking and uh, focus on had, needed, needed to have a practice philosophy from him. Mm -hmm. But what was unique about Bob's path was that he connected up with this guy named Nate Cohen Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, in, I think, 1963. Nate had a PhD in educational psychology. And Nate basically told Bob, you know, Bob, the way you communicate with patients is just horrible. No one, no wonder you're so unsuccessful in selling complete treatment plans. I mean, you've gone, you studied under Dr. Dr. Pankey, but now I understand why none of your patients are following through with your recommendations. The way, the way you communicate with people is just wrong. And that, and the fact that you feel bad about it and don't like to do that, I completely understand it because you're just, you're getting so much rejection. Nobody's going to like to do that. So so Nate Cohn was a huge influencer in Bob's life. It was really, he was a big driver in helping Bob write his book. Nate suddenly died in 1970 from a heart attack, massive heart attack. I think he was maybe 55. So poof, Nate Cohen, his basically his uh, main, main guy leader disappears from the scene. Bob said, I had to go back and relearn why I was doing a lot of things that Nate told me and it kind of made him go deeper, but right exactly at that same time is when Bob met Avram King. Avram King had been working in dentistry um, as a consultant. He'd been, I think he'd been working for Johnson and Johnson. He had very positions in dental schools, various things, but he connected up with um, Bob in 1970 and, and Avram was a social psychologist. He had a master's degree from the University of Chicago. And he was, a, he was a genius. He started at the University of Chicago when he was 16. Um, he, he said Carl, Carl Sagan was his classmate at, at, at the University wow. of Chicago. They were both were 16. And of course, University of Chicago is one of the most difficult schools to get into in the country. And so he, you know, he graduated early and then he went on to get his master's degree in social psychology. And so then he, so Avram King brought social psychology perspective into dentistry. And so this is the more um, team oriented focus. You know, it's not, it can't be just the, the doctor and their mindset. It's got to be the group functioning together in a very organized symbiotic way. That's the only way you're going to get the ball across the goal line. So that's kind of, uh, that's where Avram King came on the scene. Avram King said that he communicated with Bob every week from that time until his death, uh, either by phone or by letter. So they were very, very close. Um, Avram King uh, created an organization called Nexus yeah. that uh, wrote a newsletter um, he, I think he did something even before that. He was primarily focused on working with orthodontists, I think, before he met Bob. Um, uh, but Nexus was kind of his most well-known initiative um, that evolved into some consulting relationships and so forth. But he was a great writer and kind of thinker. And uh, he, uh, that's when I became exposed to him when I saw some of his writings in 1980. 
uh, 85, maybe 86. And I thought, wow, I've never, I've never even thought about dentistry like this. I've never thought about uh, my relationship with the patients to, in this way. I've never thought about this perspective. And uh, so that really drew me in. I knew him through his writing. It took uh, 15 years for me to finally meet him and actually work with him. Um, a few few years before he died, we brought him in um, as a speaker in our in our in the Bob Barkley Study Club, which we founded in 1998. And uh, we went out to, to Scottsdale and met with them. And I think we did another event in, in, uh, in Kansas City as well. So um, I had, had I'm not going to say I knew him well, but I, I had a fair bit of contact with him in combination with his writing. So it had a lot of influence on me as well, because he um, made me think about dentistry differently, but as did Bob. When I read his book, I thought, oh, my God, this guy knows what I'm thinking. He not only knows what I'm thinking, he knows what I'm worried about. And he not only that, but he has answers for all the things that I'm worried about. And it's like, how the heck did that happen? He's like been dead for like 20 years. <laughs> so it, uh, it was, it, you know, so Avram King sort of, who was still alive, obviously, you know, kind of became my connection to Bob. And then I eventually came to know John Barkley, Bob's son. And John took me to Macomb, Illinois, which is where Bob practice so I got to see it and sort of get a personal tour and explanation of uh, what was really happening there I actually met Bob Barkley's um, a clinical assistant she was 90 years old so and we had interviewed her and had a fantastic conversation about who Bob was as a person because you know we've a lot of us anyways are familiar with who he was um, you know on a, from a clinical perspective from a, who as a dentist who, who this person was but to hear about him, you know, as a man, uh, you know, what his character was like, what his um, relationship with his children was like, all of that. So it, it was very, very interesting experience for me. I'll be quiet. <laughs> uh, that's all right. Um, I'll tell you to be quiet when we're offline in my own way, Paul. I've done that to you before. Uh, Paul, so here we have two guys who were way ahead of their time in figuring out that number one, this stuff is all about relationships and communications. Uh, preparation, restoration, occlusion, um, margins, that comes afterwards. And all of that stuff also with the people working with you. I, I think what I remember from King, Avram King, he predicted that dentistry is gonna split into different niches and we could talk about tiers but let keep it simple that different types of dentistry no one right or wrong here but you got to know who you are and this holds true now since there are dental hygienists here in in our audience there's also assistants and administrators i'm sure but i think the disconnect comes from being something and trying to practice something else, lack of vision of who you are. And something we talked about yesterday, Paul, as we were preparing for this, something you said to me really rang true. And my very first hygienist who was with me at the beginning, Gail Artikanian is here, and this is gonna resonate uh, with her as well. Uh, Gail, Gail is doing awesome in her career. Um, but you said to me, no excellent hygienist can be maintained, that means retained in practice, without a clear philosophy that is congruent with the dentist and the practice. And we learn this directly or indirectly from Bob Barkley and Avram King. Go. Absolutely. Yeah. Go. Uh, well, I would say, first of all, Avram King, um, you know, projected that dentistry would fragment basically into three, uh, what he called tiers. And so he, you know, he said the drivers behind this will be technology and marketing. And he said, you know, there'll be a bottom, bottom layer tier, what he called tier one. And that will basically be what he called closed panel dentistry. Maybe the kind of dentistry you would get if you're in the military, you don't get a choice 
who to see or when you just go and you know they do it do it to you um level two was a uh, kind of a what he called retail dentistry that was going to be influenced a lot by marketing at that particular time it looked like you know there were going to be dental offs in every in every big mall uh that's changed now they're outside the mall but um it's a still the same idea. It's a uh, kind of an insurance centered um, mass production uh, marketing, marketing and merchandising driven level of dentistry. But the, the central mission is efficiency and making money for the investors, basically. So tier one is really about just taking care of the group. Uh, in the case of military, it's readiness. You're aware of that, Alan? I'm very aware of it. I do it. I uh, love it. And so, you know, readiness is their purpose. And readiness means, you know, this guy, this guy or gal needs to be able to call, be able to be called up next week and and not have a dental problem in the next six months. Mm -hmm. Tier two is is really a capitalistic, uh, you know, venture that's focused on generating maximum revenues and and profits tier three is uh what i would call person-centered dentistry it's dentistry that's focused on the needs and the health of the individual so it's personalized and so uh avram king and barkley were big fans of this guy named peter drucker peter drucker was saying hey the whole game is changing we're gonna we're gonna move into an area of what he called mass customization meaning you can have sped up organizations, but everything's got to, got to be individualized. And sort of an example of our time was, you know, how Dell came on the scene and you could get on, you could get on the internet and you could, and you can do that now with a lot of computers, but Dell was the first one you could specifically design your own computer. So mass customization. Tier three is kind of like that. It's personalized dentistry based on, you know, not only what the purpose of the practice is, but what does this individual want? What's this individual looking for? But to be successful in that role, uh, that person's values and objectives and priorities need to be reasonably in alignment with that of the practice, or there's just going to be constant conflict. Yeah. So this is where, you know, values, cl values clarification, all these other things kind of become very relevant. And Paul, that for one second. Yeah. We're not, let, let's understand something here because there's all kinds of dentists and, and team members or what I now call community members watching us. There's mm -hmm. no judgment here. This is just simple reality and whatever segment you fall into is okay because we're endowed in this country with three inalienable rights, Paul, life, liberty, and the pursuit of a Tesla. Oh, oh no, no, no. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of a big house. No. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So yeah. let, let's, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I do that a lot. You do that to me a lot. But um, let's just make very clear that knowing who you are and practicing so you're happy is what we're looking at here. I'm right. Sorry. So, so knowing who you are and where you are and uh, asking the question of yourself is where I am, where I want to be long term. You know, these are all important, uh, you know, self-reflective things, but there are, and that's where kind of this topic of hiring becomes uh, quite relevant. You're going to hire a different person for tier one than you yes. will for tier two, and you're going to hire a different person for tier three. Yes. So in the case of tier one, and I can speak to this personally as a, as a prior military, as a prior Navy dentist, you know, I was assigned to a ship. My, my support staff was already selected. They were there. I was the newbie. So I had to fit into their culture and I had to take the weaker members of my support team and bring them up as best I could to my level, but I had no power to hire or fire. I had to just make it work. And so that's kind of the way government sponsored anything works. You just, you get what you get and you just try to make the best of it. Yep. And it can frustrate the heck out of you, but that's just the reality of it. Tier two, you know, you're going to be hiring people that are, you know, into the business model of the corporation, whatever that might be. And that's usually high efficiency and so forth and insurance, insurance centeredness and other things like that frequently. Um, tier three is going to be much more 
uh, much more of a personalized experience. So the kind of person you're going to be looking for is somebody with a much higher level of, of emotional intelligence, for instance, you know, they're not, they're not only going to have um, a technical set of skills they're going to bring to the game, but they're also going to bring um, an emotional, a higher level of emotional skills that they're going to bring to the game. And yes. so we're, it's, you're, it's playing at a much higher level and you're moving away from um, managing people to develop what I would call developing people. Yes. So the difference between tier two and three is tier three is focused on development. Tier two is really about, you know, just getting the dentist, identifying the dentistry and getting the dentistry done as fast as possible. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And that development piece, Paul, is very important because if we are going, well, whatever type of practice model we're in, we have to develop not only the patient, but also the team or community member to move along in a content, um, happy at the job, fulfilled manner. And I think that's where the disconnect starts to come in. Well, you know, we, you know, and I'm as guilty as anybody of this, you know, there were times in my career that I was very unsophisticated about how I hired people. And as a consequence, you know, I made bad decisions. And sometimes when I made bad decisions, my first response to that was to deny that I'd made a bad decision. And I would just live with it, but I would like simmer in it. And I would look for reasons for any, any other reason that didn't involve me and my decision-making was, was game. Yeah. So it took me a long time to like have to own that. Well, if you've got a problem with your staff, there's like only one person responsible for that. And that's the person that you're looking at in the mirror every morning. Yeah. And so that's, that sucks having to like own that because that, that puts a lot of responsibility on your shoulders, not only in selection, but also in development. And so the more sophisticated your practice model, the more sophisticated you need to be about hiring and the more sophisticated you need to be about development. Yes. If you're going to, if you're going to hire a bright, sophisticated hygienist, let's say, they're going to get bored as hell if you just put them in some remedial role that everybody else is doing. They're going to want to leave dentistry, maybe. Or so, see a position with a higher salary, thinking that that's going. Or they're going to chase bottom. the money, you know. So, um, so you've got you've got to create a stimulating environment that's growth oriented for that individual. If you really want to keep the high achievers, the high a group a team of high achievers are the hardest people to retain because you've got to constantly be looking at what what are their needs, what are their expectations, you know, why why are they coming to work here? Yeah. And so, um, it, and it's hard as dentists, it's very easy, easy for us to lose focus on that because we're so distracted by so many other things. Yeah. And we just, we, we very easily want to put that part of the practice on autopilot and just sort of let it go. And, you know, the average, the average high hygienist would probably be fine with that. He's leaving me alone. He's staying yeah. out of my hair. He's not telling me what to hear. She's not telling me what to do. But the top level hygienist is going to go, you know, what's going on here? There's like no freaking leadership around here. So yeah. and and so if they're, you know, they're the kind of person that probably has some leadership skills, too. That's the reason you hired them. So they're going to they're going to be uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got to hire for not only for the role, but for the position, but you've got to hire for the role which is yeah. a much broader perspective. Uh, Jennifer Stanley is a hygienist and I believe a consultant also. I don't know if you can see the chat. Um, there are so many reasons for the shortage in our industry, our profession, please. Uh, it cannot be pigeonholed into just one thing. It's way more broad than that. Yeah, it is. It is. But I, I, think, I think that what we're talking about here is making the profession of dentistry attractive by knowing who you're trying to attract as a community member and by not disconnecting from your own personal values and your job values. When we blend those two and who cares what it is, if you're a volumer, great. But if you're, if you're a, a leader, 
who doesn't want to lead, if you're put in a position of leadership and you can't lead, there is a problem right there. And I think uh, I'm reading a great book, Paul. We talked about this yesterday. I forget the author. Last name is Pulver. Um, I think it's it, last name is Pulver. I love it here. And if, if you want to be the type of leader in any organization, it's connection and expectation. You can't have one without the other. If you want good results, you've got to connect with people so that you and they understand each other and are driven by the same things. Right. And, and I, I agree. Um, th this is a very, very complex issue. You know, yeah. you throw COVID-19 in the middle of this thing, it gets like exponentially more complicated. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of people have a lot of hygienists and other staff have left dentistry just because they didn't feel safe or they didn't feel that the office they were working in was really addressing the problem on a significant enough level for them to feel comfortable there. And then, you know, they had to go back to their families or children or grandchildren or whatever the situation is. And they just, it just wasn't working for them. Yeah. And, you know, the ones that maybe they were the second uh, breadwinner in the home, they had some freedom to just say, eh, I think I've had enough of this. Uh, they, they left, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that that's a very big part of this as well, but there's also, you know, there's burnout. There's a lot of, lot of things there's, there's, Phys you know, just the physical demands of being a hygienist are huge. Yes. You know, um, you know, my previous hygienist, you know, she had to have rotator cuff surgery and she was out, you know, for six months from, from that before I had, had worked with her, but, you know, she, she'd been practicing hygiene over 20 years and, you know, she was physically, it was really taking a toll on her. So, I mean, they're, you know, running a very, sped up practice with hygiene assistance and all that um you know there's only so much the the human body can take and so if the you know if the practice is just focused on production and it's not really dialed into the you know the humanistic needs of these team members you know they're eventually they're going to say nah, i've had enough of that yeah um if you so. if you're looking at the chat uh cindy rogers is also a very very fascinating brilliant uh uh, woman of dentistry, uh, I feel some were waiting for the excuse that they needed to run, to run away because they weren't happy. Yeah. Yeah. COVID-19 was a perfect uh, cork to pop. Which is kind of a, that may be a good segue uh, into talking about probably your best prospects for hygienists and really for other people are, are people that are already working, but they're not uh their you know their spiritual needs other needs other than financial needs are not being addressed very well now what i've found is that a lot of hygienists and other support staff don't even know there's another other ways to practice there they don't know that maybe down the street and around the corner there's a practice that the culture and environment is completely different than the kind of mill environment that they live in that's the only thing that they understand and to see. And they, that's their, they kind of have a one dimensional perspective of what dentistry is. So the challenge becomes, how do you communicate your difference out into the community so that, and this is the same, this is the same challenge with marketing for patients. If you really have a unique practice model, if you really have a unique experience, if you really have a health centered purpose, that you're delivering day in and day out how do you get that message out into the community and yeah. so uh, that can only begin with a very clarified you know philosophy yes. and that can only begin with you know clarified values and all the other things that precede it and um you know the the best people i've hired were already employed someplace else and I found an effective way to connect with them and say, hey, oh, by the way, you know, your experience in dentistry, and this is true, again, this is very similar with patients. Oh, by the way, your experience in dentistry may be incomplete. Mm. You may not understand um, some of the other aspects of dentistry that exist, but you just haven't been exposed to them. And, you know, what, why don't we have a chat about that? I think we're, we, uh, th that's a, uh a very, very serious point, because I think in that we are fighting external forces, both from third party payers and 
from the so-called pro-competition environment that's been created to lead people to believe that a cleaning is a cleaning is a cleaning, a dentist is a dentist is a dentist. And we on the inside know that that is absolutely not true. Not one better or worse. We're not going there because there is a market, there is a segment of the population for all this, both in our, in our teams, communities, and in our patient communities. That, that's, that's not the issue. But the issue is that we offer a unique and remarkable experience on whatever level, and that's where we have to play. That's the field we've got to play, both as employers and employees. Right, and uh, there's going to be a particular person that you're going to hire that's going to be a better fit for that. And there's going to be other people that aren't going to fit very well. And conversely, you know, in that tier tier two example, that retail high merchandised example of dentistry, high, high speed uh, version, you know, there's a person with a certain temperament that fits that better. It's yes. going to stay there longer. Um, and it's the person that really doesn't want to think too much about it. And particularly they want to, when they hit the door at the end of the night, they don't want to be thinking about it either. Yep. So, um, you know, they're not the kind of person that's going to worry about, you know, what happened to Mrs. Jones today and mm -hmm. how, how she feels about it versus, you know, an, a more highly empathetic person who's going, oh, geez, you know, that was really a struggle with her. And I know um, there may have been some confusion about what happened or this or that, and maybe I should call her and just make sure she's doing okay, you know, yeah. so th this is a very different, different kind of person. And um, you're not going to teach that into anybody. They're going to arrive with it or without it. Yep. And so your hiring process needs to be dialed into looking for that, you know, aspect of their personality as well. Not just yep. them talking about it, but them doing it as part of who they are as a person. So your practice purpose, your practice mission is very much in alignment with who this person is is inside so yes. they in, what they instinctively do is ex, is what you would tell them to do without having to tell them to do it right yes so you know, so uh and that that makes leadership easy when everybody on your team is kind of share, shared values and priorities then uh you know that's kind of where my practice is now i don't spend a lot of time telling my team members what to do or when to do it I just kind of walk around and go, well, that was cool. I like the way she handled that. That yeah. was a lot better than I would have done or whatever, you know? So it's, um, they get into a position where they're so strong in their area that I'm, you know, I'm learning things from them or I'm standing back and kind of admiring, well, that was, that was pretty masterful how you handled that. Yeah, That was tough. You know, that was tough. So, but that, you know, those are, you know, players that play above the rim a lot and that's not your average person right. and so you know it it who you hire and who you retain really needs to be aligned with what what it is you're trying to do what, where are you going with this thing long term and if we turn it around paul if we look at the other side of that card for our hygienist assistant and administrator friends out there it's who you accept a job with will deter, is determined, should be determined if you want the best result by who you are, what you love to do, where your heart is, and evaluate the practice owner and see if it's a fit. If it's yeah, not a fit, unfortunately, the you know, just, gonna retain you. Yeah, just like patients, employees, yeah. prospective employees aren't necessarily that sophisticated about making those decisions. Sometimes that you've got to kind of help them yeah. Um, so, so my most recent hire um, as a hygienist, I just had her come. I said, "Why don't you?" I didn't even have her fill it. <laughs> I'm starting to do everything the same way now. I didn't even have her fill out an application. I just had her come in and talk with me. And when I, after we'd finished that conversation, that was maybe 20 minutes. I said, "You know, would you like to just come in um, on Monday and just hang out and maybe shadow?" Julie and um, just see if you think you'd like to work here. Yeah. And so, and I, you know, I said, you can stay as long as you want, um, ask any questions you want. And then, 
And then after that was successful, I said, well, why, don't, why don't we do this a little more structured? Let's like, you know, um, let me get your details. And, and so we just kind of stepped into it. But my, my first concern was, um, was whether or not she was going to be happy here. You know, yes. it's got to be, it's got to be win-win. You know, is this, mm-hmm. does this um, align with who they are or not? Does it, and, and, and it's, going to resonate with them pretty quickly i think yeah uh or not and you know then you can kind of go into a more formal hiring process when you think you've got a a, kind of a psychological philosophical match the other the other piece of it that probably isn't talked enough about is just uh interpersonal chemistry and uh, after playing this game for a long long time i can't predict who's going to get along well with who in advance. I can think, you know, I I may have a decent idea, but it's sort of like chemistry. You don't really know until you mix it all together and see, you know, is this going to be uh, synergistic or, you know, is there going to be some subliminal issues that are really going to be troublesome? And so some of that stuff you've got to test out, you know, in uh, maybe a 90 day hiring or something like that. But, uh, so that there, there's always an unknown piece as you jump into this, but if you kind of do it with your eyes and ears open, you can maybe make fewer mistakes as you proceed into it. Yes, and we're going to make mistakes. We have and we will. But I, I want to take you back to just a moment ago, Paul, when you talked about that initial meetup, that there's no forms, there's no disk, there's no, and, and there's everything right with that. But the way you and to a degree I am able to do it is we know who we are. We've thoroughly introspected and we're pretty clear on what we want to do and how we want to do it and who we want at our side. That can't be done on a whim. That that takes a lot of mental work. Well, yeah, I mean, you're you're either... um you have a proclivity towards introspection or you don't. I mean, I, you know, I've certainly met a lot of dentists who just, you know, give me the handpiece and tell me, you know, hand me the burr and just let me grind some teeth dust. And, and, you know, that's what, you know, that's what drives them that, and, and dealing with people and dealing with people's emotions and dealing with groups of people and the complexity of all of that. That's like, eh, I think I'll just hire a corporation to run my practice for me. Yeah. Uh, If you can't, if if you don't want to do it, don't do it. uh, You know, and there are other people that like me that um, I like kind of getting involved on a granular level. I like understanding, but it, it it is a lot of work. It, it, it takes a lot of uh, I'm not perfect by any means. So it it takes a lot of self understanding about where your blind spots are and you know, where you, where you need help. Yeah. And um, and organizing yourself on a higher level. Yes, exactly. One of the things that all of this is going to lead to, and it's something uh, you've seen me screaming about from the mountaintops, is that the missing ingredient here, I mean, back in the early days, uh, Tony Robbins used to talk about live with passion. I remember hearing those tapes, but I think it goes beyond that. And I think the word passion is used a little bit much. But I think if there is a culture of love in your office, love at an appropriate level, obviously, but that if we can blend together with cohorts in our practice, that we're all on the same page, we're all on the same side of the box, pushing together towards some common goal, there can be a bond of love created in the office that is so special that makes Monday morning a good thing, and it makes you happy. If you gotta work, you might as well work happy, and you can have a culture of love and happiness that generates loving kindness, as our friend Dave Karsten talks about, every single day, not perfect, but every single day, so some act of loving kindness is gonna happen in that office, and that's a great thing. Well, yeah, and I, I completely agree with that. Um, I, frequently write about and think about um, M. Scott Peck's book, Road Less Traveled. And if you haven't read that, that needs Mm -hmm. to be on your reading list because it's basically a a 
maybe a 275 page dissertation on what love is and what love is not. And um, that really opened my eyes. Scott Peck kind of defines love as really kind of um, the unselfish, you know, giving to another person for the intention of their personal growth and development. And, you know, there may be times when that isn't very fun. And uh, let me just give you a good example. There probably were, well, a thousand or more times in your life, Alan, when your son or daughter was doing something that didn't make you very happy <laughs> and you did uh, something out of tough love to kind of get their attention and get them back on course. That's what I'm talking about yeah. is you're, you had a bigger goal in mind. You had a long-term goal in mind about what you wanted, what kind of man you wanted your son to be and what kind of a woman you wanted your daughter to be. So you, you were standing back with a, philosophical perspective in mind and saying, ah, uh, you know, we got to do a little direction change here. You know? <laughs> and so yeah, you can phrase it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you start looking um, and, and done with kindness. And so uh, if you think about love, loving your patients, loving your staff in that kind of framework, you're, you've got a broader perspective, you've got an agenda that's developmental for everybody, you're mm -hmm. trying to, to bring them up to their highest potential, and the patients. And uh, you do that with leadership, principle centered leadership. I mean, that and that's, yeah. that's love. I mean, that from that perspective, that's how Scott Peck defined it. Yeah. And the, the thing that I loved, the other thing that I loved about that book was, uh, he called uh, people who refuse to learn, uh, he defined that as evil. Somebody, somebody who, was, who denied their, um, their abilities, their, their God-given abilities, refused to, to access them and develop them. And he said, that, that to me is kind of what evil looks like. Um, the no, failure of a person to really become what they were able to to become you're, you're but anyways it's a it's a book that really makes you think about a lot of things if you've never read it i'd strongly recommend mm -hmm. it all right paul we could go on forever uh and and we have in the past personally and here online back during the lockdown but this perspective i hope gives all of you an idea of why this some of this stuff is happening. And um, as Jennifer said, it's very complex. But foundationally, I think aligning with the proper, the, the right office or the right hygienist, assistant, administrator, etc., is really foundational. And nobody, nobody practices and preaches that Paul like you. Uh, give us a please a short synopsis of this uh, incredible project you're working on, the Henny Center. It's going to be in Roanoke at the top of a mountain with an amazing view. I've been there, um, but uh, no, I haven't. You've invited me there. I've been to your old home. Uh, right. We'll get to the top of the mountain, but tell us a little. Just give us a synopsis of the Henny Center in construction and what you're going to be doing there because it's really exciting. Well, what's going up on the mountain is, uh, which is about, which is almost exactly, th exactly thirty minutes from my office, uh, but it's uh, about fifteen hundred feet higher up in the air. So we have actually a different climate up there. So when it's uh, ninety here in the valley, it's uh, a nice eighty up there, upper seventies, and not so humid. So it's a really nice place to be in the summertime. In the heat of the summer and all, all seasons for that matter. But anyways, um, here at my office, actually where I'm sitting right now is uh, part of my teaching center. We have a, a hands-on area, lab area where we can seat uh, about 12 people. And then we also have a uh, lecture area that can seat about 22 people. And then I've got what I'm building up at on the mountain is a big space that can probably have about 40 people um, that'll be for kind of retreat kinds of things, um, meetings that where you would tend to kind of break up into small groups and maybe um, think for a while, take a walk on the on the pass. We've got 10 acres up there into the woods or whatever you want down to the creek 
or the barn, and then you come back and maybe share with the group what what you're working on. This would you know be maybe a philosophy statement or a mission statement or something like that, and um, you know these kind of uh, team development sort of workshops. So that's what I kind of plan on doing up there is uh, kind of facilitating Dennis doing more of that because that's at the core of what we've really been talking about over this last hour. Mm -hmm. If you're not clear about that stuff, you can't get clear about who you're going to hire. If yep. you can't get clear about who you're going to hire, you don't know how to develop them or you don't know why they're not happy or whatever. So, you know, the center of it is, you know, as Dr. Panky said, know your, you know, know yourself. Know yourself. Yep. And, uh, uh, and then that needs to be uh, carefully shared with the team and the, and you need to select people very carefully they're in alignment with that and what you're trying to achieve so uh, that's kind of thing we're going to do up on the mountain in addition to just uh, have dinner events and things like that up there yep yeah this is uh, and i've been at your courses and uh, my, my crew and i have been down roanoke and we've studied with you and i've spoken for you in the past and that was one of the high honors that i've been given and I got to tell you, Paul, you, you are you are pushing a very high level of learning that is not for everybody. We wish it were, but it isn't. And I would encourage you to um, go to the Bob Barkley Study Club on Facebook because Paul's writing is fascinating at worst and inspiring for sure. And what Paul is going to be doing, um, if you can get to it, don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. Watch this guy, because he gets it. Um, well, one Paul, of my one of my one of my favorite Barkley isms is uh, uh, he said we got to make people think. We got to make our patients think. Yeah, if they're not thinking. They're not learning. And if they're not learning, they're not going to be able to change. Yes. And so, I try to write things and create situations that maybe push you a little bit into the discomfort zone and make you think about why you're feeling that way, because I'm just trying to catalyze maybe a new perspective about something. Yep. Um, most, most of these things that we're talking about are not, as I, as I already mentioned earlier, most of these things are not easy things to understand or acquire. They can sometimes take years or even decades to really kind of get under your belt. Yeah. But uh, the only way that you can achieve it is to just stay on it and suffer through the mistakes and keep yeah. asking the questions um, because otherwise you'll just get stuck and frustrated. And I think that's where a lot of people are in dentistry right now. They just don't know what direction the answers lie. And, yes. and my answer to that would be it's the place to start is inside yourself. Yeah. Right. That, that last piece that inspired this get together that, that you posted on the Bob Barkley study club page that I, um, um, peeled away from that. I don't want to say ripped off, but I peeled it away and put it on, uh, put it out there for a lot of people to see you made me very uncomfortable. And a lot of times you do that. I'll go through some of your stuff and I'll think, what the hell is he doing now? And by the time I get to the end of it, I think, damn, I got to think about this. And then a couple of hours later is one of those moments. And uh, yeah, Paul got me again. So do, do that's, read. Yeah, that's my purpose. Get, yeah. get people thinking. Now, and, I'm going to uh, put this you know, I, I don't really care. I mean, if you've got a, a solid um, defense, against me or whatever i i'm glad to discuss it that's what i want is is dialogue so yep respectful yep. discourse curiosity yep. listen yep. generously all the things that we've learned and that we yep. teach speaking of which a um, couple of things that um I'll, I'll repeat on my page number one this is being recorded it will be here on better richer stronger i've also got a youtube channel in development and we'll have it there. And, and I'm sure, Paul, I'll send it over to you and um, you can post it up. So this is for you all to partake in. We are here to grow you. We are here to make life a little bit better and Monday morning not suck. And uh, we're going to announce this later, but Paul's and my very good friend, co-learner, teacher, inspire, Mary Osborne, uh, will be with us on Friday on Facebook Live. Because Mary, uh, Mary teaches both of us. She learns with both of us. 
and she is a, she calls herself a recovering hygienist. So Mary will give us a hygienist coach consultant point of view on this. Um, and it will be just a total mind, mind opening experience. And we will further explore this thing here because the connection, the consistency, the congruency, the integrity of ourselves with our work is really the key to a happy practice and a happy life. So I hope this was helpful to all of you. Paul, you're my friend at tour. You are my friend, you're my mentor, uh, you're my buddy. Uh, I cannot thank you enough, not only for being my friend, for contributing to my development, but for all you're doing for this profession. You're a special guy, Paul, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. Talk to you soon. Thanks. All right. Everybody, have a great weekend. Live healthy. Eat right. Get some exercise. Make somebody's life better each and every day. And of course, Paul, you know this one. Enjoy the ride. Paul, stay with me. All right. All right, we are offline and we'll stop the recording.